This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. If I could speak to my nine-year-old self, I would, I would say, Ruta, failure is a prerequisite to success. Well, this is a real treat for me, Ruta, for you to be here. Ruta Sepetis, yes, right? Yes. Now, tell me how you say your name in Lithuanian. Oh, for your Lithuanian viewers, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Ruta Shepetis. Oh. But not very many people call me that. <laughs> Do people have trouble with your name? They have had trouble with my name since I was a child. And imagine you're in a classroom, it's the first day of school, and the teacher's reading roll, and you know alphabetically it's coming, it's coming. to you. Right. And then sometimes they would say, I'm not even going to try this. Or they would just call me Ruth or Rita. You know? oh, wow. So I answer to everything. <laughs> you are an incredibly award-winning mm. author. Thank you. Um, and, and you have such an incredible story. You, this is your latest book, uh, Salt to the Sea, which is a phenomenal book. Thank um, you. Just so incredible. It's on the New York Times bestseller number one, right? How about that? Winner of the Carnegie Medal? How about that? It, it, incredible. If anyone would have told me, you know, years ago, this is what's going to happen, and you're going to be a number one New York Times bestseller. Right. I wouldn't have believed them. I wouldn't have. It just, <laughs> and I probably would have lost my nerve. I think <laughs> I might have chickened out. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't. Me too. Um, and you're here, actually, in our region uh, earlier this year because of the 10th annual uh, dinner with an author. Did you know that they put your picture on all these bookmarks? I didn't. How great and I'm is that? so excited. Sponsored by the Putnam County Library Friends. And um, thank you, thank you for coming to our community. No, this means so much to me. And even though I am Lithuanian, I do have some family, extended family roots here. My husband was born in Cookville, and my father-in-law got his undergrad degree from tech. And so That's it's great. sort of a homecoming for me. That's awesome. And you live in, you live in Nashville, I right? Do. I do. Um, you've had a really interesting life in that you were born and raised uh, in Detroit, Michigan, um, California. Yeah. And then ended up in Nashville, where you met your husband. Exactly. That was that was the path. I am um, my I'm the daughter of a, a Lithuanian father and an American mother. And as a child, uh, my father lived in Lithuania. And when the Soviets occupied Lithuania, my father escaped, and he lived for nine years in refugee camps oh. before coming to the U.S. And they went to Detroit uh, because my grandfather was an engineer, and there were. Uh, opportunities in automotive there. Mm -hmm. So I grew up outside of, uh, of Detroit and went to college mm -hmm. there. Um, wanted to be a writer in mm -hmm. third grade. Wrote my first book in a spiral bound notebook that had a jar of pickles on it. Um, mm -hmm. My fellow classmates liked the book. The parents did not. Oh, <laughs> yes. They, one parent in particular got really upset by that, right? They did. And, and it, it stole my courage. Oh. It stole my courage. At so eight years old? At eight years old. And so I didn't write another book for 25 years. And instead, I pursued storytelling, but through music. And that's what took me to Los Angeles. So how did you get into music? Because music is like three-minute stories, right? They're, it's so amazing to me, people who are songwriters. How yeah. did you really get into that? Well, I, I was raised in a household with books and music, and so there was always music in the house. And I realized pretty young when my mother pointed out to me that I was singing lyrics to a song that were maybe inappropriate for a five-year-old. <laughs> I said, well, what does it mean? And she said, it's a story. And that really stuck with me. And to your point, a song is a three-minute story. Um, and working in the music business, really has helped me as a writer because it, it gave me a sense of rhythm and flow and we might read something today and five minutes later not be able to recite what we've read mm -hmm. but tonight you might hear a song on the radio that you haven't heard in 10 years and you can sing every word to that yeah. song and that's because melody and rhythm make things memorable and that's what I learned in the music business but how I ended up in the music mm -hmm. business was basically um, 
driven by fear. I had written this book as a child in third grade um, and dreamed of being a writer, and it all went horribly wrong. And the book became very controversial, and the last thing a child wants is to become the center of an enduring drama in school. Right. And it stole my courage. And so I thought, well, I mean, it was that quick that I would, I would say, well, I, I, can't, I can no longer do this. And now that I think about that, mm -hmm. you know, what a shame that was. Right. Um, but instead, I said, okay, well, I can't, I can't, I can't be a writer because this is scandalous. Um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue music. What was that story? What was that story you wrote as, as an eight-year-old that scared people so much? <laughs> The story came from an assignment mm -hmm. from our teacher who said, true creativity is taking the expected and making it unexpected. So we could take on a creative project. We could do a dance. I decided to write a novel. And this was in the 70s, okay? Uh, and the book was called The Adventures of Betsy. Mm -hmm. And during the 70s, there was a lot of stranger danger. Right. Do not get into a car with a stranger, um, you know, a, a lot of kidnapping dangers. Mm -hmm. So. I thought, take the expected and make it unexpected. Mm -hmm. Nine-year-old Betsy's adventures were with a 35-year-old dude who lived in his van. <laughs> and I illustrated the whole thing. And his name was Cool Cat. And he was drinking and smoking. And I, I drew cases of beer in the van. And, but this was the unexpected. Right. Cool Cat was a great guy. Right. And he imparted all these life lessons to Betsy amidst <laughs> drinking and smoking with the nine-year-old. And, and my friends, my, the nine-year-old. They loved it probably. They loved right? it. And my teacher used it as an example. You know, how did we take the expected and make it unexpected? Mm -hmm. But when my friend took the book home, the parents didn't understand. And my mother told me, she said, sweetheart, you have to realize your fiction might be someone else's fact. I was nine. That was really big for me. And when my brother said, your fiction is someone else's fact, what does that mean? And I said, well, it means that Lucy's mom is having adventures with a man in a van. <laughs> oh, I, to no. I told people in the class that. Oh, no. And the whole thing escalated. Oh, yeah. And kids were wearing shirts that said, free Betsy. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it became a really big deal. You know, now I think in my... 50-year-old head, it's a much bigger deal yeah. than it probably was. Some of my friends don't even remember it. So that's how you know memorable the book was. They right. don't even remember it. But, um, but I remember it. Yeah. So. And what do, what do you think happens to kids when they get that, their courage stolen? I mean, think about that. How, how, many, how many really artistic people are we missing because of vulnerability and fear and shame? millions and if I could speak to my nine-year-old self I would I would say Ruta failure is a prerequisite to success on my book it says number one New York Times bestseller winner of the Carnegie Medal what it doesn't say is woman who has failed a million times and I wish it would because each failure brought me closer not only to success and how do we define success but brought me closer to really my authentic self and what I'm supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. which I am supposed to be telling stories and writing books. But I spent 25 years sort of kind of on the sidelines wanting to do it, but, but not jumping in the pool. <laughs> Let me read just some, because it is important. I'm, this isn't your first book, um, but this says, um, Ruta Sepetis, acts as a champion of the interstitial people so often ignored. Um, whole populations lost in the cracks of history. I love that. I mean, that is so true. And, and talk about the other books you have written that do that same thing. Yeah, all of my books uh, tell stories of what I would call, how do I say, strength through struggle. Mm -hmm. they're, they're people who believe that the world has forgotten them. They're pieces of history that are important, but somehow have slipped through the cracks. And through my research, I have been able to interview people who have experienced the unimaginable, but believe that their story is not important. Mm -hmm. And that just, it amazes me because there are such lessons of hope and courage 
and the miraculous nature of the human spirit, I sat with a man who was condemned to a death camp in Siberia during World War II, and he told me that his suffering was his greatest spiritual teacher. And wow. those are huge lessons, mm -hmm. and I lie in bed awake at night thinking, I need to find those stories before we lose these incredible right. teachers, this generation of incredible teachers. So how did you choose this period of time? It's 1945. Um, how did you choose? It's, it's Europe when the Soviets are invading Germany and people are trying to get out. Yeah, it's the salt of the sea is set in winter of 1945. Mm -hmm. So World War II is coming to an end. And at that time, there were millions of displaced people, millions of refugees that had been forced out of their countries mm -hmm. um, and were on the run. And my family were amongst those people. Um, my father had made it into a camp in Germany, but his cousin was caught in this area that at the time was East Prussia. The Germans were coming in from the south, the Russians were coming in from the east, and in between were millions of civilians that were being slaughtered right. in their path. And my father's cousin and her family, they were on the run, and they were granted passage on this ship, which is called the Wilhelm Gusloff. And many people think that the Titanic is the largest maritime disaster in history. But near the end of World War II, there was a ship that sank with a death toll that dwarfs the Titanic of the Lusitania, Titanic and the Lusitania combined. Wow. But yet this is a story that somehow has slipped through the cracks of history. And my father's cousin had passage on that ship, and that's how I know about it. Wow. Yeah. That's, and I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know about it. I didn't know about this. it. And it's part of my family history. And I, I encourage people, don't be, don't be embarrassed. Who knows? There are always things that we don't know and we can't know. Um, but to have a sense of wonder and curiosity and a sense of empathy for someone who m might have gone through something mm -hmm. unimaginable, you know? Right. It's at that moment of connection mm -hmm. that I think our heart like opens and we have a chance to make progress. And that's, those are the stories I look for. Yeah. Well, it's a great, it's a great story and, and it is timely because with all this discussion about refugees and yeah. immigration and and um, how does that impact you when this comes out and you're hearing these current stories? Well, it was a complete coincidence. There mm -hmm. was actually someone at a book event who said, how wise that you would <laughs> write this book about a refugee crisis during a refugee crisis. But the way that the writing process works, as, as you probably know, is you write the book years before. Right. Um, and it just so happened that this current refugee crisis aligned. But you know, teachers and librarians are my heroes. Um, Teens don't go, students don't go running into the library saying, quick, give me a book about a refugee evacuation through East <laughs> Prussia. But teachers are assigning the book in high schools. Mm -hmm. And it's the young people who are bringing this history out of the dark. And so I often say an author has nothing without readers. And because I write about history, I, ha I have nothing without, without readers. So really, it's the readers who are doing the good deed here. <laughs> and we should say a special thank you to Cookville High School Library. Absolutely. Right now. It's such a great opportunity. Young people are deep thinkers and deep feelers, and they, they interpret things with a sense of emotional truth mm -hmm. um, that's really spot on, and I'm grateful to have them as an audience. They, they take me to the, to the mat, and, and they, yes, they will tell me if they like the book or if they don't like the book, and the reader is always right. And mm. some of the most stimulating conversations come from these groups of young people. And what's important is the reader's interpretation, not the author's explanation. And I tell right. them that. So I'm anxious to see today um, you know, what kind of challenges right. <laughs> they throw forward. Do they usually have a favorite book of yours? Yes, I do find that. And my books are quite different. My, mm. my first book uh, tells the story of a Lithuanian girl, a Lithuanian artist, who is arrested by the Soviet secret police and deported to a death camp in Siberia. And that's basically based on my father's family history. Right. My second book is set in 1950 in New Orleans and tells the story of a girl who is born into a very underprivileged circumstance. Mm -hmm. But despite the life she's born into, she determines that she's going to be the author of her own destiny and she's going to go to college. And it's, it's a story, I say, of learning to fly when you've been born with broken wings. And that's really my mom's story. <laughs> and, and then Salt to the Sea is my father's cousin's story and part of my, my father's wow. story. 
What are you working on now? You know, my publisher, they always say, whatever you do, don't talk about the new book. <laughs> so here's what I'm working on. Okay, great. <laughs> um, uh, the new book is set in Spain during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. Um, we know some about Hitler. We know some about Stalin mm -hmm. and Mussolini. But we really don't know much about Franco. Mm -hmm. And my book centers on the lost children of Francoism. It's estimated that during Franco's dictatorship, approximately 300,000 infants were stolen from parents that didn't align with fascism. And they were gifted, traded, or sold to fascist families, to American families. Wow. And this is a story that, that hasn't really been resolved yet. And so I want to show the complexity of Spanish history. As a Lithuanian American, it would be very difficult for me to go write about the Spanish Civil War. Right. But what I can show, and I hope to show, is the complexity of what life was like under a dictatorship. How do you decide which historical piece to write about? This is um, part of the amazing uh, blessings of touring. When you go on tour, you meet people who have stories that are, they say truth is stranger mm -hmm. and richer than fiction, and it's true. And I meet people, and they will share their story with me, and then I will go investigate it. And so I have a list currently of 23 novels oh <laughs> that I'm on deck, I'm on deck to, to write. But, you know, when I look at those concepts, they mm -hmm. all involve concepts of family, mm -hmm. identity, yeah. home, and like I said, strength through struggle. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to me as a writer because if you would have asked me when I was a child what I'd be writing, I would have said I would have been writing humor. <laughs> Never would I have thought I would be writing these dirges of death during World War II <laughs> or you know, these, these sad stories in, in right. New Orleans. But I believe that the art mm -hmm. does reveal the artist, yeah. and I have to accept that. There must be something inside me that gravitates to these sad stories. Well, we learned so much. I think I, I heard, um, I think it was Melissa Etheridge said one time that uh, her latest album just wasn't sad enough. That <laughs> people, really? people just weren't as moved because she was really pretty happy at the time. And right. but the album that she, when she was going through cancer treatment and a breakup and all this other, that those songs really resonated for folks. So maybe there is something. I think about there that. is, but again, I'm a glass half full person, but right. so I see that as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. What it tells me is that as human beings, we want to be empathetic. We have a sense of justice. We fight for the underdog or maybe within these books and music, we find ourselves, mm -hmm. and that makes our world a little less lonely. So I think it's a positive thing. I don't think it's a self-destructive thing. Right. Um, and I find, especially with middle school students, with my first book, mm -hmm. if you would have told me that seventh graders would be, you know, really gravitating toward a death camp in Siberia, but they do, and they have such a sense of justice. So the name of the book was, is Shades of Grey? <laughs> Between Shades of Grey. Between Shades yeah, of Grey. Yeah, let's clarify that. Because yes. <laughs> not the other. <laughs> Can you imagine? Shades of Grey. I mean, I never thought this book would be published in the first place. It was. I'm so excited. Yeah. Between Shades of Grey hits the New York Times bestseller list. And my mother calls me and says, <laughs> Do you realize there's a book, another book that has Shades of Grey in the title that's been released? And I said, Oh, well, who knows you know, how it'll do? Mm -hmm. And my mother, my elderly mother, said, I think this one's going to be pretty popular. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right. Oh, that's so funny. And your other book is Out of the Easy? Out and, of the Easy. Yeah, and Easy being the Big Easy the big of easy. New Orleans, right? Out of the Easy, but also the, a play on words that, um, that sometimes it's best if we don't take the easy mm -hmm. road. Uh, if, if it's hard, decisions shape our destiny. And, and man, it's, those deci decisions are, are hard. Uh, but sometimes it's better to take that difficult path than the easy one. Are these works moving towards film or television? Thank you for asking. <laughs> I know that a lot of authors, you know, when I talk to authors, they say that would be my biggest nightmare mm. to have my work adapted to film or TV. Well, because my books are based on hidden history, I'm desperate to have the works wow. adapted. That's the way you really reach a large audience. Mm -hmm. And my first book, Between Shades of Grey, 
is uh, finished. We just wrapped. Uh, we're editing. It's called Ashes in the Snow for obvious reasons. We've changed the title. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to take part in the, in the film and in the screenwriting uh, process. It's incredible. And that comes out next year. And Universal Pictures uh, won the auction for Salt to the Sea. Mm -hmm. And That's Lorenzo great. di Bonaventura, who made The Perfect Storm and Deepwater Horizon and Harry Potter and Transformers, he is making oh, wow. Salt to the Sea. Yeah. That's exciting. It's so exciting. <laughs> That's terrific. And so will they consult with you as the writer, or do you know how that works? You know, my first film, because it was first done independently, mm -hmm. I was able to have a lot of involvement. This one, being Universal Pictures, um, I don't imagine that I'll have as much involvement, mm -hmm. but I trust the team so deeply that's making this movie. And I'm a novelist. I think novel writing and screenwriting are different art forms, and some authors can do it. I'm not one of them, so right. I'm, I'm happy to see them shepherd salt to the sea to the screen, right. but I hope I do get to go to the premiere. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. So in this day of digital, um, what, do you think, what do you think there is in the written word that just continues to pull people in? I think in the written word, we have a true creative partnership. Mm -hmm. In television and film, they show us the character. They show us the setting. But in the written word, the reader creates the character. The reader creates the setting. The reader's the one who is amplifying the emotion. And so it becomes a very deep and personal experience that isn't shared perhaps with everyone. And so we have an emotional attachment to it. At least that's my theory. Right. Um, man, I have so much I want to talk to you about. <laughs> and we're going to run out of time before I get all of it in. But um, you moved to Tennessee. What is it about Tennessee that, that brought you here and that you love? I'm so glad you asked that question because Tennessee is a huge part of my writing process. Um, when I lived in Los Angeles, I didn't have a three in the morning phone call. I had a lot of acquaintances and a lot of colleagues, but I didn't really have someone that if something went wrong at three in the morning, that I had someone to call to help mm. me. So I moved to Tennessee um, for a better quality of life, but also for community. And I have found a community, a creative community, a writing community. I've been part of the same writers group for 12 years now. We meet every two weeks at the library, wow. <laughs> exchange our pages. They're a huge part of my process. Um, I, I have lots of three in the morning calls and I tell people that love and, and, and safety, it gives you courage and wings. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to say, I'm gonna write something and it might be terrible, <laughs> but who do I love and who loves me? Right. And that's Tennessee. You know, I wow. have people who, who will stop on the side of the road if I'm, if I'm pulled over. Mm -hmm. And it's not LA, I'm not locking my doors and writing that, that they can right. help me. Right. And I really believe that does allow me to, you know, expand my creative wings. And not to mention my family, now my in-laws are from, you know, are from Tennessee mm -hmm. and they're beautiful people and welcoming people. So it has a huge, a huge um, amount to do with my creative courage. Is your husband in the creative business? My husband is so creative. He is a, a photographer and, and a cyclist, uh, and he works in corporate finance, which I have to convince him is creative. <laughs> right. Um, but he is a really creative human being um, and went to public schools in Nashville and is the smartest person I have ever met and, um, and generous. And so I have a very strong net, and I, I don't take that for granted. Right. I can jump. I can jump and do something crazy, and, and there's someone saying, I got gotcha. you, I got gotcha, you, Spetties. <laughs> and do you really live in a tree house? Well, we bought a piece of property and built a house up into the trees, so it's not wow. sitting in a tree, but you see it's all glass in the ceilings and on the walls, and you see trees from every window, <laughs> but that's actually not where I write my books. I write my books in a cabin in Baxter, Tennessee, <laughs> Wow. That sits on a ridge that overlooks uh, Center Hill. So I see my husband fishing below, or I'm on the fishing boat <laughs> writing, mm -hmm. and he is fishing. Um, and I've written all three of my books there. Wow. I know. And I have <laughs> an amazing community there of neighbors who support me. And I'm sure your, your family, your father, your mother, and, and your brother, all really influential 
in your life and in support of you. Massive. And, and again, you're asking such good questions. People don't generally ask these, but yes, my family taught me that we can't choose our hardships, mm -hmm. but we can choose how we face our hardship. And they prepared me for life that was going to be so, so difficult, so difficult. And I just like grew up as this kind of scrappy digger and, and a fighter. Mm -hmm. And that's how I approach everything, with a fire and a passion. And I can't choose what's going to happen, but I can choose how I face it. Just in 30 seconds, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to a young person or not so young who may be looking for their dream? I would say that at the center of your dream is the concept of story. And if you can harness that story, whether it's a funny story or a painful story, whatever your dream is, if you're harnessing story, it will resonate with emotional truth. And that's what draws people to you, to your endeavors. That's what makes you memorable. So don't be frightened you know, to either dig up your own story and harness your own story. Thank you. Thank you, Ruta Sapetti. And we hope you'll come back and visit again. Anytime. <laughs>